Juvenile offenders are often lumped into one category, but the children, yes, children, who enter the detention facility arrive there for a variety of reasons, and not all of them need to be there or stay there. Please welcome David Robinson. He's a security counselor who has gained a lot of wisdom through his many years of working with troubled youth. And he joins us today to talk about what the detention center does and what it is also doing outside the walls of the facility. And um, that, that is a, a hugely important part of uh, working with today's youth to ensure that they don't go back. That's correct. Yes. Thank you for having me. Um, first of all, we serve three particular populations. We have a pre-D population, which is uh, residents that stay approximately 30 days until they've been adjudicated. Mm -hmm. We have an outreach component, which essentially provides electronic monitoring and other services to kids while they remain in the community. And it's usually that first point of contact where they start to receive some kind of services and assessments and then hopefully what will happen is that there will be a coordination of services to minimize any reoccurrence or recidivism. The final service we offer is a post-D program which I lead and it's for children who have been sentenced to uh, confinement within that facility for a period of six months and during that time frame we work from the premise that a lot of behavior is not uh, criminal in nature so much as it is uh, act of not knowing any other alternatives. So we begin teaching social skill sets, um, we teach behavior patterns, we monitor those, and uh, basically we teach some skills, uh, entry-level uh, vocational skills, and we've just started that program until they've been adjudicated, finally finish their sentence. So there are many things that we may take for granted that some children really don't have exposure to before they've actually gotten into the facility or they haven't learned them or applied them to their lives? Uh, within the last decade, there's been a tremendous amount of research done about the science of adolescence development. And what most uh, research agrees upon is that the adolescent brain is not fully developed or is able uh, to consistently do higher level cognitive and executive functions until the age of 21 or 25. So prior to that time, it becomes real contingent that we provide them with enough exposure, uh, enough alternatives, so that they can make sound and rational decisions when they reach that, that age. And that's primarily what we strive to do in the post D program. Okay, so it's to help guide them through what can be a really rocky period for any kid, but it can be particularly rocky for them. So you want to make sure that they have the tools they need in order to make better decisions. That's correct, and, and that's pretty much been a change. I've been in the field over 20 years now, and initially when I started out, it was merely incarceration. It was just control, you do your time, you get out. What we do know is that the vast percentage of juveniles we work with will be returning to the community, and unless we do something to minimize or correct behavior, they'll return to the communities and they'll still uh, perform some of the same acts that caused them initially to get in there. So um, the field now is moving in the direction of we want to do and provide some level of treatment so we can minimize the recurrence of any criminal behavior. Okay, so kind of breaking the cycle of that, exactly. that behavior exactly. by teaching them something new. So you, you work with them. Are there some specific things you do um, to work with these youth? Um, well, we work from a co cognitive behavior modality. Um, and it's based primarily on the premise that most behavior is done because of thinking errors. So we try to recorrect those thinking errors. But in addition, on the post D program, we have, uh, we require our residents to give back to the community um, through service learning projects. Okay. Previously, we've had a young lady who had constructed wigs for cancer patients. We've made numerous donations to food banks, Salvation Army, even to the Up Center's bookstore. So uh, by giving back to the community, we get them in the cycle of realizing that there are other people who have similar problems or problems that are worse than the ones they're experiencing. So life isn't really that bad. So we try to give them something to contrast and compare because regardless of how bad we think our life is, there is always somebody else who has conditions a little worse. Uh, the last major project we did uh, with the PD program, and, and uh, we had it in the newsletter, so we thank you, 
um, families got involved in the process and they sponsored through World Vision um, providing a total of eight chickens for families in third world countries. And uh, what we explained to them during that time frame was that we were looking at making positive long-term changes. Uh, part of that was being working from that old adage that you can give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day. If you teach him to fish, he can feed himself for a lifetime. So that was the premise we worked from. So uh, we give back to the community. We get them involved in doing positive things in the community, and that's one of the goals of the service learning projects. Yeah. And they can feel good about what they've done, too. Exactly. That's so important. Exactly. To feel that what you've done is valuable. Exactly. Yeah, that makes a big, big difference. There are a lot of different aspects to what, is going, uh, to what you do and how you work with, with the youth in, in detention. And we don't have time to talk about all of them now, but I hope that we can continue to, We'd um, be happy to. to, to focus on in some of the different aspects so that people really are aware of. Um, there's a lot more that goes on. Um, in the juvenile detention facility than what you may assume is going on. And those mm -hmm. assumptions can be um, quite off, and that's why we want somebody like David um, to share his, his experience, because he's spent so many years um, doing what he does, but, you know, the insight that he's also you know, obtained mm -hmm. over, over time. And sharing that with people on so-called the outside, you know, so that you know. You know, there are real human beings and there are young people in there and, and they do have some chances to and turn that was, their lives around. That was one of the biggest observations we had made because uh, when you work with them daily and you see them on Saturday morning looking at cartoons and eating cereal and doing the same thing that your family would do or neighborhood kids would do, you realize that they're still kids. Yep. And sometimes because of the environment, sometimes because of maybe mental health reasons, because of... Um, parents didn't have a proper uh, super supervisory pattern, they've got off track. Mm -hmm. But you see that they're still kids, they're still malleable, and so that's an opportunity for us to do what we do and to provide them with alternatives to look at to once again contrast and compare and decide upon what's a better course of action. So. David, thank you so much. Thank you, Jane. This for is a great us. way to start. We'll continue. Thank you.